Adavars. Ye mere khayal hai hamari khush kismati hai ke we have Nasreen Rehman among us. She has travelled all the way from England. She is a very multi-talented, faceted woman. Uh, she is a historian. She is an economist. But for our purpose, uh, she is a translator as well. And uh, as the, that Portugali guy, Saramoga, said, that a writer, can we uh, dim the lights? I think she's a little. A writer creates uh, only a local art or local book, but the translator makes it a universal or accessible to everyone. So thank you for, for your wonderful work. And, uh, so we have short time and a lot to talk about. Um, the first obvious question that comes to my mind is, why Manto? What prompted you to translate him among this host of beautiful writers from Pakistan? Uh, first, uh, I'd like to say uh, thank you uh, to the LLF, uh, of which I sort of feel a conjoined part since I was there at the first LLF in Lahore. So how exciting to be here for the LLF in New York. And thank you everyone at the Asia Society for um, uh, in hosting us, but also helping me with the overheads, etc. cetera. So um, why Manto? Uh, I'll, I'll sort of go over that quite uh, quickly, I'll rush through that because I want to talk much more about Manto rather than why Manto, but I suppose that will also unfold with why Manto. Um, I'm a sort of inveterate student, and in my 50s, I went back to university to study history. I'm a lapsed economist. Uh, and my PhD was on a history of the cinema in Lahore. Uh, 1919 to 1947, and it was on the cultural politics of love. Uh, I'm a historian of emotions and aesthetics. Um, when I was writing about the cinema, it was very easy to find material on directors and uh, uh, actors and so on. There was very little about the nitty gritty and what actually happens on the set when a film is actually being made. Uh, now, why Manto? Uh, and why did I turn to Manto? I was introduced to Manto by my mentor, uh, Mothrama Zehraniga, at age 13. And I think it's, uh, it's the provocative nature of Manto that he stayed in, in my life. Right. So at 13, and I was in a convent school where the uniform was uh, skirts, frocks. So I said to Zehrabi, and I'll say it in Urdu first, I said, Zehrabi, class There's a girl in our class and she doesn't wear knickers. So Zahrabi looked at me very coolly and she said, to isme kaun si badi baat hai? You know, what's the big deal? Si jangya, jangya Unko khalish hoti hai. A lot of girls don't wear knickers because they are uncomfortable. And she launched into Moselle, the story that I was hoping you might read in Urdu a little bit because it's in the book. And that, of course, stuck me and glued me to Manto. So from age 13, I was you know, reading Manto, not always finding the stories easily in bookshops and often getting glared at by booksellers as a young woman looking for Manto. So what I wanted to look for I wanted to go back to his stories because he has written about the gaffers, about the spot boys, about the people who are bringing um, tea and the actors and the directors and of course his essays, which Khalid Hassan Saab right. had translated. The essays I sent to my supervisor, Chris Bailey, but the stories when I started looking for them, in fact, they hadn't been translated. So I translated 15 for him. And he suggested that I should do more and carry on. So therefore, uh, the translation. Well, that's uh, thanks to him as much as thanks to you. But you know, the answer I thought you might be you know, coming to is that Manto is a historian in a way. Gee. I mean, you know, as a literary giant, he Gee. wrote the wonderful history Gee. of partition 
and, and violence and et cetera, and the human psyche. And you being a historian, you know, by nature, probably that might have I, attracted you as well? Well, I used him as an ethnographer in my thesis. So because I was using him as an ethnographer, that's why I used Manto. But I want to turn, in fact, to the title that's been chosen for this, right. Evergreen Manto. So I thought about why evergreen, because it's not immediately the adjective that you think about when you think about the dark stories, but also, of course, there's a lot of humor, there's wit, and of course, he's very relevant today, particularly because Manto's lens is steadfastly focused on violence and sexuality. And today, in an age of Me Too, and in an age where there's a war, a genocide raising, uh, because of religious reasons, I think Manto becomes very, very relevant. And I'd like to turn to you, Said Saab, to please read from Sahai, and where Manto is uh, uh, talking to us. Relevant in that. Yes, that, because where he's yeah. saying that, you know, if you kill Hindus, uh, Hinduism will not finish. If you kill Muslims, Islam is not going to finish. And where he's looking for a redemptive humanism. So I think. Uh, uh, sure, I was, I was hoping we'll come to that later. But you know, once you mention it, I'll bring it down now. Do you have the. Um, so the I will read. Sahai in English? I okay. In English. Yes, I, I can do it in Urdu. And I was being rude. I was trying to find out Moselle, but it's not here. So <laughs> in Urdu. So we'll have to. I have another selection, which was one of your favorites that, you know, Nawab Salimullah Khan. We can do a paragraph from there if you have it. Right, right, okay. So uh, regarding Sahai, ye mat kaho ke ek lakh Hindu aur ek lakh Musliman mare hain. Ye kaho ke do lakh insan mare hain. Tragedy asal mein ye hai ke marne aur marne wale kisi bhi khate mein nahi gaye. Ek lakh Hindu mar kar Muslimano ne ye samjha hoga ke Hindu mazhab mar gaya. Lekin wo zinda hai aur zinda rahega. इसी तरह एक लाख मुसलमान कत्ल करके हिंदुओं ने बगलें बजाई होंगी कि इस्लाम खत्म हो गया मगर हकीकत आपके सामने है कि इस्लाम पर एक हल्की सी खराश भी नहीं आई वो लोग बेवकूफ हैं जो समझते हैं कि बंदूकों से मजहब शिकार किए जा सकते हैं मजहब दीन ईमान धर्म यकीन अकीदत ये जो कुछ भी है हमारे जिस्म में नहीं रूह में होता है छुरी चाकू और गोली से ये कैसे फना हो सकता है यू वांट टू जस्ट टेल अस इन इंग्लिश हाउ दैट नरेट्स डू नॉट से अ हंड्रेड थाउजेंड हिंदूस हैव डाइड और अ हंड्रेड थाउजेंड मुस्लिम्स हैव डाइड बट टू हंड्रेड थाउजेंड ह्यूमन बीइंग्स हैव डाइड द रियल ट्रेजेडी इज नॉट द डेथ ऑफ 200000 ह्यूमन बीइंग्स but the missing scorecard for those who killed and those who died. Muslims killed 100,000 Hindus and thought they had erased Hinduism, but it is alive and will continue to live. Hindus slaughtered 100,000 Muslims and celebrated. They believed they had wiped out Islam, but the truth is there for everyone to see. They have not damaged Islam in the least. Those who think violence can exterminate religion are foolish. Doctrine, religion, faith, dharma, belief, devotion, call it what you may, is not in our bodies, but in our souls. How can knives and bullets destroy souls? And that's so true, I mean, you know. <laughs> I think one of the uh, basic requirements of a wonderful piece of art or a, um, a piece of writing which is going to last forever is that it is for all times. It, that, that's why Manto is so relevant today as well. That while he wrote in that time, you can you know, extrapolate it today 
So what we are seeing in, you know, the genocide or the killings or the fightings in the name of religion, one, one side or the other. Um, it might be like, you know, worth asking you in the same breath, uh, Mantu has a lot of writings. So uh, how did you, you, and you have uh, compiling them in three volumes. So how do you decide, you know, which ones to go in volume one or two or? Gee, that was interesting because when my publisher approached me uh, after I'd sent the 15 stories, uh, which were all to do with cinema, because they hadn't been translated before, they approached me and they said, would you translate all of his short stories for us? So of course I started rereading and reading and rereading, I think for a year before I decided what I was going to do. And I think that what struck me was how in a very short space and with great economy, he can distill a notion of time and place and mood. So then what I decided was that I would do, because I'd already done 15 cinema stories and they were all to do with Bombay, that volume one would be about Bombay. And of course, when I reread the stories also, Bombay is perhaps where Manto was happy, if he was ever happy. He was certainly happiest in Bombay. So I did uh, the Bombay stories first, and then volume two, which has 100 stories, volume one just has 53. Um, volume two is to do with the rest of India before right. 1947, and volume three is um, Pakistan. And I'm working on two and three together. Beautiful. No, no, that's, that's, that's such a wonderful way of dividing that, and that will help us, you know, reading in, with, with different perspectives as well. Mera Khyalta, you had um, a, a Shajra uh, slide as well? Or uh, can we, so, can uh, we click to that? Or? So if we can, where the slides are, um, uh, look at slide one. Uh, and uh, so we actually, um, Manto's uh, family tree is very interesting. He was a Saraswat Brahman. His family were originally shawl traders in Kashmir. And in the late 19th century, they came down to Amritsar and they went into a bourgeois transformation uh, they became lawyers and lived in uh, a place called Kuchai Vakila, which I've translated as Lawyer's Lane. And uh, we don't have a pointer. Pointer. pointer, but you see this black line here. This is Manto's sister. This is Manto and this is Sikandar, the baby brother who died. Now all of these, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, are in fact his siblings much older from his stepmother, his Munsif sub-judge father's first wife, and all of them, uh, the male, males of the family, they were barristers and engineers, so bourgeois professionals. And poor Manto, who was naturally drawn to literature and the arts, uh, and it would have been much nicer if his father had shown no interest whatsoever in his education. He showed a great deal of in, uh, interest and forced him to study the sciences. And as a result of which, of course, he flunked his matriculation three times. Uh, and uh, also uh, never passed his um, entrance. Um, and uh, his mother was not treated very well by the rest of the family. She was not a Kashmiri. And Manto saw at very close hand familial violence and what happens to women who don't have private incomes. Uh, Balaji, his sister, um, was married to an engineer in the railways, lived in Bombay, and uh, a philandering gent who was having an affair with the live-in uh, nanny, and uh, 
couldn't leave him because she had nowhere to go. And when the father died, the mother didn't have a lot of money either. They were brought up uh, and left with 40 rupees a month uh, given by barrister brothers. Um, and it was in 1936 uh, that uh, Manto actually moved to Bombay. And if we could have the second slide, please, which is, uh, uh, N no, the second one should, uh, th that's his, <laughs> that's his uh, matriculation uh, certificate. Uh, certificate, which he finally passed. He was born in 1912. He finally passed it in uh, uh, 1931. Uh, and uh, uh, also because a schoolmaster showed interest in him and actually moved him to the arts, otherwise he'd have flunked again. <laughs> well, uh, in a way, it's it's not surprising. His father was a you know rather religious leanings, you know he had religious writings as well. Uh, Manto, on the other hand, a man of literature, interested in human psyche, interested in sexual psyche, you know, and things, and very sensitive guy as as we find out. Gee, uh, indeed, I mean Manto was of course. Uh, it was interesting, he also mentions that he always started his work with Saat Art Che 786, which is uh, the Harufe yeah, object like a Bismillah for Rumar. Bismillah. So uh, somewhere in his uh, psyche and on the broad spectrum, he acknowledged that he was a Muslim, but that's where it stopped. And of course he drank a lot and he was an alcoholic and uh, later on when he got married, his wife and family who found it very, very difficult to deal with his alcoholism because they didn't realize that addiction was an illness. So it was a rather complicated relationship with Safiya, right? His wife, um, on one hand, uski jo sari hai, is, usko istri kar rahe hai. On the other hand, you know, they had a very uh, unhappy relationship as well. I'll bring the slide and then you can talk about it as well. Gee, uh, well, the marriage was arranged because Bibi Jan, his mother, had moved to Bombay as well. Mantra was in Bombay. Um, he'd moved uh, in 1936, as I've said. And uh, uh, Bibi Jan, as they called their mother, Balaji was living in Bombay as well. Her husband was there, so the mother moved to Bombay. So when they, uh, she moved to Bombay, she, used to, she was quite sociable, and she met this lady who was the mother of three, a very bourgeois lady who had come from Zanzibar, and her husband had died there. He was very fair, and he was mistaken for uh, a white person, and he was killed. Um, Bibi Jan arranged the marriage. And Safiya's family, because there was an allure attached to the cinema, but what they didn't know was that people in the cinema, other than the directors and the producers and the stars, rarely got paid on time. They were paid on account. So Mantra was earning enough, but not ever really getting money. He also then had a problem with alcohol and it was very difficult for Safiya, who was used to this sort of bourgeois milieu where men went to work. So the allure of the cinema didn't always hold. Right, right. Huh? And then uh, he got a job with All India Radio in Delhi. And he went to Delhi with their little son, who was Arif. And of course, we've been talking about um, Ghalib, uh, in, uh, Iftikhar uh, talked about Ghalib. Mantra was obsessed with Ghalib, and he had a great affinity with Ghalib. And as we know, that Ghalib had a nephew whom he had adopted, who was called Arif. Arif right. So it was not a coincidence that uh, Mantra named his firstborn and his son uh, Arif. And Arif, at 18 months, uh, died in um, Ghalib city and Mantu just barely, I mean, he couldn't bear to live there. Right, he, and he sank left. further into his, and, yeah. and we know, I mean, uh, of, uh, you know, there's so many Urdu dance sitting over here that uh, when Arif died, 
غالب روٹ دیٹ مرسیا لازم تھا کہ دیکھو میرا رستہ کوئی دن اور تنہا گئے کیوں اب رہو تنہا کوئی دن اور تو ماہ شب چار در ہم تھے میرے گھر کے پھر کیوں نہ رہا گھر کا وہ رستہ نقشہ کوئی دن اور نہیں نہیں اٹس فیسنیٹنگ اس لیے کہ انہوں نے ان کے اوپر کئی He has named his short stories after that. Absolutely. He has used his verse, you Absolutely. know, as, 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 کیا چھیڑ خوباں سے چلی جائے اسد اور غالب اور چودویں آگرہ میں مرزا نوشا کی زندگی دیر سکس اور سیون ڈفرنٹ ونس ڈو یو وہ وٹ یو تھنک فیسنیٹیڈ ہم وتھ غالب ادر دین دیٹ مے بی دیور دیر اے جینیس یو نو ان کامنالٹی بٹوین آئی تھنک اٹ از بیکاز ایون ایف یو لک ایٹ اے اسٹوری لائک ٹھنڈا گوشت ہاں سو وین ہی ڈیڈیکیٹس ٹھنڈا گوشت It's dedicated to Ishar Singh, right. the man who abducts a girl who's dead, who has sex yeah. with her. But, 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 or, but, you know, say, yeah. but then becomes impotent. impotent right. And what Manto says is that I'm, he dis, uh, dedicates the compendium of those short stories to Ishar Singh and says that even when he had descended to the lowest, he did not forget his humanism. So it's this constant search for humanism. That's Absolutely. what he has, that's the affinity with Ghalib, that's his bond with Ghalib. I think this, since the schedule, I'm just going to take a sight, and um, how much time do we have? I want to like pace it so I can get the most out of her. And I want to leave some time for the questions as well. Razi or Rachel? Hmm? Okay, that's wonderful. So, uh, no, minute? that's really, uh, do you want to make a comment about the picture? Hmm? Did she say one minute? No, 20 minutes. <laughs> 20 minutes. Okay, so I'm also quite behera, so. Uh, okay, so we can. We well, you might be behera, but you're not be behera. And that's good for us. <laughs> because, you know, if you were be behera, then we will be amiss. Yeah, I wouldn't okay, you want to make a comment on that? If I would be behera, yes. Uh, well, Uh, the lady in the background is uh, uh, Zakia, who is uh, the historian Aisha Jalal's mother. And uh, Aisha Jalal, of course, we've, uh, has written on the, pit, uh, the pity right. of partition. Right. And uh, that's Safia. And it's, it's a Bombay um, photograph. And they're looking quite convivial and happy. But in a lot of his sketches, this, uh, because he inserts himself into his stories, and which is why I chose him as an ethnographer because he's there. Right. And in a lot of those stories, there's a lot of bickering. There's a lack of money. Um, I mean, she wanted a divorce, right? So uh, That was later. later. You've jumped. Yeah. When they came to Pakistan, um, she, in fact, wrote to her brother because he'd become a complete alcoholic. And he was borrowing money from passers-by. He was drinking tarra, et cetera. And, Imagine for her, and by now they had three children, it was not easy to live with somebody whom she loved. She never stopped loving him. Right. He was just impossible to live with. And then she started accompanying him every time he went out. I think every wife says that, right? <laughs> It's impossible to live with. But anyway, <laughs> let's see. This is your certificate. And then you want to talk okay. about this? Yeah, I want to talk about, he was obsessed with pens. So um, you can see his chef's pens in that suit. And here he's got pens, a pencil in his mouth. So he used to write with pens and pencils. And he did at one stage get a typewriter. And there's a very interesting anecdote about a competition between him and uh, the Hindi writer who also used to write in Urdu, Op Opendranath Op Ashk, Op Ashk uh, at, who wrote Girti Diware. I think they're Hindi walas here. So Ashk and he had a, a competition. <laughs> on <laughs> typewriters. So Manto turned up, uh, you know, with his typewriter. So a few days later, Ashk Saab arrived with an English, English typewriter typewriter. and a Hindi Not typewriter only one, right, and right. an Urdu typewriter. <laughs> But here he is. And I, I think, I mean, uh, this is a bit sassy and this is quite reflective. But the sassiness is still there. So I like these portraits. He had yeah. very bright eyes. He had very intelligent, and you know, if you look yeah. in both of them. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, I mean, yes, he has a sharp gaze, sharp to say gaze. the uh, to say the least. He's also a voyeur, 
So we can talk about that later, if you want. Well, you know, he was writing about the people who, who were in the borders and writing uh, he about, was also you know, writing partisans. About, yeah, so he, he had to have a sharp eye to pick up the right girl. Uh, yeah, well, um, well, and he was also <laughs> writing about himself. Okay. Uh, so this is Kisan Kanya, a 1937 uh, film. And uh, it's got a... was the first movie in some respects, right? This wa he was the screenwriter for this. He did not get a credit because he was unknown. So the producers said, Ki ye to inka, inka nahi kisi right. ne suna. But this was his first film, and it's also, it bookends his um, career as a screenwriter in India. So this is the first one, and then we've got the last one. And they're both historical films. This as the first Technicolor film, and then of course Technicolor right. is forgotten, it did so badly. And Moti B. Gidwani, of course, as uh, uh, Iftikhar would know, uh, was uh, someone who was directing films in Lahore after this. And um, so we can go move to the next one, uh, no, the film, which is... I think that's the Mirza only Ghalib. slide there. No, Mirza Ghalib, the film Maybe should be in there. Maybe the end, hold on, let's see. Yeah. Okay. Now, Mirza Ghalib is very interesting, the politics of this film. He, it was released in um, 1954. And if you see the Devnagri um, image over there, because in this also, it's got just Mirza Ghalib in English, Nietzsche said the Urdu one has got cut off. It's got, and it's got a, a dot under the j, which makes it z, and it's got a dot under the g, which makes it r. It's Mirza Ghalib. That one just has Mirza Ghalib. Now, this film in 1955 got the award, the silver award, gold for the best film, and Maddeningly, silver for the best Hindi language film. I ask you, a film about Ghalib written by Manto, where the screenplay is written by Manto, and this feeds into the politics of language in, cin in the cinema as well. Because in the Toki Devdas, the 35 Toki, they couldn't bear to call the language Urdu because it's Urdu, not Hindi. They called it Farsi. I think I'll miss the opportunity if I don't ask you, how do you see this today? Um, you know, Urdu in India or coming back or not coming back or how do you see it in England? There's a, you know. Well, I think that's um, a, it's a bit complicated, but mm -hmm. I'll talk about Urdu in uh, uh, India. Mm -hmm. Zinda Bad Rekhta. Okay, Nobody wonderful. Nobody can stop Urdu in India now. Okay. The governments can do what they like, and the kids are going. Oh, I don't know if Sanjay is in the, the audience. You know, <laughs> nobody can stop it. Bravo, right. Sanjay. Bravo, Rekhta. What an amazing, amazing website. And Urdu lives in India. Wonderful. Zinda hai. Sorry, it was a side question, but you know, I couldn't like, nee, stop myself. It's an myself important question, and that's we why I there. sort of talked about Because the politics of language, and if the Khar also mentioned that Urdu uh, was there in uh, Punjab, but alas, it wasn't the Punjabis who chose uh, Urdu, it was the British who uh, brought it there. And when they did, uh, the Sikhs and uh, the Muslims, and there's a lot of correspondence in the home uh, department files where they're complaining that, you know, why are we being made to learn this language when we were learning a classical language, Farsi? So, uh, you know, Koldo or Kali Shalwar or Toba Singh or, you know, whatever. Everybody is familiar with them for various reasons, and obviously they're all beautiful stories. Um, I learned from you that one of your favorite stories is that Nawab Salimullah Khan. Gee, it is. And I want to know why. Well, what attracts you there? Okay, so the thing is that Manto is known largely and the, even the compendiums where stories have been translated, they're the same stories, uh, usually about partition violence or sexual violence. 
Um, Nawab Salimullah is a very interesting story, and it could almost be a Henry James story. If you were reading it in English, you would think, oh, this could be Henry James. Um, it's quiet, but it really nails both race and class, because this is an Anglo-Indian uh, housekeeper. Lovejoy. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Lovejoy, working for uh, Nawab Salimullah Khan, who sold his estate. He's a widower, he's lonely, and he comes and sets up an establishment in Bombay. So I think you'd agree And, and a very, me. very, very excellent, you know, part of it was that he unfolds the human psyche, mm -hmm. that Nawab Sahib is lonely mm -hmm. and he's willing to uh, sleep with her. But then he wakes up, you know, and then he says, oops, um, how can I bring her up to this level? Um, if you can find it there, um, okay, so I'm, you know, in, 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 in just keeping with the time, I'm just going to read a very few lines in the end. So you got the background, you know, b between us, we have given you an idea. This is when he wakes up in the morning after coming back home and uh, after they have slept together. Do you need time? The, uh We'll what just I, go to the very end. Oh, yes, no, no, I know where it is. I know the story very well. But the point is that he never actually mentions they're sleeping together. You don't have to, you know. It's, um, it's, it's in bad taste. No, no, but you said, you said, <laughs> because I think it takes away from the finesse of the story. Because he never actually mentions. So he just, he just mentions, uh, let, let me say how. When he to Nawab Sahib ne Mrs. Lovejoy ke liye dawaza khola. और गैर इरादी तौर पर उसकी कमर में अपना बाजू हिमायल करके अंदर दाखिल हुए मुझे से आदमी के लिए काफी है ये जो हूं हूं था दैट वाज वेरी टेलिंग मिसेस लवजॉय ने कोई इतराज नहीं किया सो यू नो दोनों तरफ थी आग बराबर लगी हुई दूसरे रोज खिलाफे मामूल नवाब साहब 6 बजे जागे एकदम उठकर उन्होंने अपने सागवानी पलंग को इस तरह देखना शुरू किया जैसे उनकी कोई चीज गुम हो गई है और वो इसे तलाश कर रहे हैं मौसम सर्द था लेकिन एकदम उनकी पेशानी अरकालूद हो गई उनके तकिए के साथ एक तकिया था जिस पर मिसेस लव जॉय के सर का दबाव मौजूद था व्हाट एल्स डू यू नीड मैम नवाब साहब दिल्ली दिल में पशेमान हुए कि उन्होंने जिनकी लोग इतनी इज्जत करते हैं जिनका मुकाम सोसाइटी में बहुत ऊंचा है ये क्या जलील हरकत की इस किस्म के ख्याल इनके दिमाग में ऊपर तले आ रहे थे और निदामत की गहराइयों में डूबते चले जा रहे थे कि मिसेस लवजॉय अंदर आई और उसने हसब मामूल बहुत मौदबाना अंदाज में कहा जनाब मैंने आपके गुस्ल के लिए गरम पानी तैयार कर दिया है बैरा आपकी बैटी लेकर आ रहा है आप पीकर फारिग हो जाएं तो गुस्ल के लिए तशरीफ ले जाएं मैं इतनी देर में आपके कपड़े निकालती हूं आई विल स्टॉप देयर एंड एंड आई जस्ट रीड इन फैक्ट नॉट द बिट दैट यू श्योर श्योर but I will introduce Nawab Saab. Nawab Salimullah Khan was a man of great discernment and, and refinement. Counted amongst the wealthy in his town, he was neither decadent nor a celebrant of luxury. Nawab Sahib, who was around 55 years old, led a quiet, sober life. He met a few select people, hosted regular parties, and served alcohol, but with restraint. In fact, in all matters, he favored moderation. He was 40 when his wife died of a heart attack. Although grief-stricken, he endured the sorrow as the will of the Almighty. So, uh, again, uh, the will of the Almighty, uh, of course, is a great um, instrument and a great um, unlocker of things for the bourgeoisie. And Manto often uses this term uh, when uh, he's talking about um, bourgeois hypocrisy. It's often the will of the, uh, of the Almighty. So, um, of course, he had an acute sense of humor. And I, I don't know if that's gone up. Uh, I, uh, because uh, his daughter, in fact, sent me an image of uh, the 
nishane imtiaz that the Pakistan government had uh, bestowed upon him. And this is, of course, a commemorative stamp. A commemorative right. stamp. Uh, I think this was 19 or uh, 20, uh, 20 or I, 5 I don't or something, know. I know 2015 or 25. But anyway, in 2012, he got um, the Nishan e Imtiaz. And Manto had predicted this. And uh, I think um, we don't have much time left, but uh, one of my favorite Manto stories is from the third volume, which is called Shaheed Saz which I have translated as the manufacturer of martyrs. And there is this uh, Marwari who comes to Karachi, and he gets involved in this, that, and the other, and then he gets into the construction business. And he notices one thing, that shahadat ka bazaar bahut garm hai. You know, it's something that's hugely popular, and everybody claims that they want to embrace it. So he starts building uh, though numbery buildings, which uh, you know people buy flats and then they collapse. And he's found his road to heaven because uh, he's made so many shaheed. shaheed. So I think it uh, with with that humor as well. And since we're sitting in uh, New, New York, York, New York, uh, can I uh, finish without talking about his letters to Uncle Sam? Uncle Sam. And uh, you talked about him being a historian because they seem prescient. And one person that I think one should mention uh, when we're talking about Mantro as a writer, uh, because his father certainly didn't encourage him and father died, was the gentleman Bari Sahib, who was a very interesting uh, fly-by-night person. He hadn't qualified from Aligarh University, but he liked to write Bari, Bari, Bari League, right. League uh, with his name. And Mantu has written that had it not been for Bari Saab, he would not have turned to writing, and he would have been uh, either in a pauper's grave or just rotting somewhere. And Bari Saab, actually published his first story in his fly-by-night newspaper. And Bari Saab got him to translate Victor Hugo and uh, Gorky and got him on the way right. to writing. And so they're all present there on, in, on Rechta, his, uh, some of his translations. And yeah. Bari Saab's own writing, which I couldn't find anywhere, right. I found on Rechta. So Zindabad, Rechta again. So. Uh, uh, I mean, Manto is somebody who holds up this mirror to the bourgeois milieu, but not just to the bourgeois milieu, to human beings. And what I love about him is that he never loses, never loses his humanism. In, in Koldo, you know, where partition violence is going around, women are being raped, and Sakina is, of course, raped by Muslims. Uh, when the father finds her in the hospital and the doctor says, referring to the curtains, call though, draw the curtains, she lets her shalwar down. And the father doesn't say, like so many fathers would have said, ban kar do, ban kar do, chup, chup ho jao, iski baat mat karo. He says, meri beti zinda hai. Zinda hai. Uh, I would, uh, I was in fact had some exception to the title, but we won't discuss it here. What, you know, you, you gave it the name of Draw String, but anyway, before we conclude, I want to say that the truth that the truth is 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 that uh, we are lucky she's here. You know, Zahir has a lot of time. You know, he's read the Manto ko from different aspects. So everybody knows about Manto, hopefully. But if you have questions, there we are. It's hard to see.
You were going to say something about the letters from to Sam, Uncle Sam. If you could uh, maybe say a little about that, that would be relevant. Sorry. Do you were you you were going to say something about his essay letter to Uncle Sam? The letters, the nine letters uh, to Uncle Sam, and I think that what is telling about them is that Pakistan, of course, in the 50s had got had turned its foreign policy and aligned itself very strongly with the United States. And he is um, time and again in those nine letters and which have been translated and uh, they're published and they're translated. I think they're almost uh, like, uh, I don't like to use the term prescient because it almost diminishes his understanding of history and the relationship between the past, the present, and the future. So he, what he's doing is in those letters, he's signposting the possible outcomes of Pakistan's complete turn towards Uncle Sam. And uh, for instance, also, I mean, uh, there's a lot that's been said, and he's, you know, often claimed as an Indian writer or a, a Pakistani writer, etc. And his daughters laugh, and they say that the Pakistan state gave him <laughs> the nishan e imtiaz because they were nervous that India might give it to him. But the, but the point is that. Um, he is recognized in Pakistan. He's got a commemorative stamp there as well. And he used to celebrate, by the way, Pakistan Day with his uh, daughters and used to make uh, flags and buntings and things like that. So, uh, but basically his, what for me is really strong is his humanism. So Pakistan should not be reduced. And one of the things that we haven't talked about, of course, is his, uh, um, obscenity trial in Pakistan, where he's found guilty, he's actually acquitted by a judge with a beard, and the judge laughs and says that had I convicted you, you know, people would have said that uh, I have a beard and I've convicted you. It was uh, the same judge who came up with the doctrine of necessity for Ayub Khan's Ayub Khan. martial law, um, who convicted uh, Manto in the High Court for obscenity. And it's a and beautifully uh, argumented essay that he wrote about his own. Yes. So if you guys have not read it, you know, read it uh, why he doesn't think his writing was not obscenity. We all do, but uh, just read his argument and see. I think we are running short of time. Um, anybody else? And I just want to leave question. one thing that Fair Saab, who said, that the writing is not obscene. I know. But he said it's not literature. But yeah, that's what I was going to say, but he didn't favor it either. And that was about Thanda Ghosh. Go ahead, please. And the progressives and the modernists, and you know, uh, uh, they had uh, disagreements. Although Faisal was very helpful when Manto first arrived uh, in Pakistan, he gave him a, a job to write a short. Uh, um, well, there were different skits. movements as well, so yeah. you know. Yeah, uh, but Manto was a modernist. Right. He was not a progressive. We have writer. a question there before yeah. we are thrown out. <laughs> Gee. My no, people have to have lunch. Right. I'll try and make it quick. My question is about your translation philosophy. I don't know Urdu, so I don't know what, how easy or how difficult it Manto's Urdu is to translate into English, but. Um, did you try to stick more to the spirit of the letter or the, the, or the story itself okay, when that's, translating? That's a very interesting question uh, because I grew up in a family where my father was from the Punjab and my mother was from UP. And this book spoke fluent and excellent Urdu. But their Urdu was very, very different. Abba's Urdu and Amma's Urdu could not have been more different. And my nana and nani spoke a different register of Urdu. Very UP, very different. And very often when I read in Manto and sometimes he say, Aap jaye, so I say, ah, you know, uh, instead of jaye, uh, 
that's one thing that he, he writes Urdu for me, and that's why Nawab Salimullah is so interesting, because he shifts the register in Nawab Salimullah. Generally, he writes more in a bourgeois Punjabi register, his Urdu. The other thing is that translating Urdu to English is not that easy, though a lot of us here in this room, I'm sure, do it simultaneously all the time because a lot of us are bilingual. So even without realizing and thinking about it, depending on the different people that we're speaking to, we translate simultaneously. I did not stick to the letter of the law. And I read the books again and again, um, and each story that I translate, I live with it for a few days. And then I think about how would he have written it if he was writ writing it in English. Because uh, of my work on the cinema or even looking at the historical archive, you're imbibing the words and you're simultaneously you're translating. Sometimes you become literal, sometimes you don't. But English and Urdu are temperamentally not that similar. My French is not very good, but the sense that I get of the language is that it has more affinity with uh, Urdu and the French translations that I've read, particularly of poetry, uh, they appeal to me more uh, than uh, translations of uh, uh, Urdu poetry into English. Well, what I can say, this is I've been beautifully translated. That's very kind. Um, of you. you know, no, I'm not being kind. I'm just being truthful. I'm serious. This is very nicely translated. It's not literal translation. Voltaire said, if you do a tr literal translation, then you, you know, the words become killers. Um, and you said very interesting thing that you, you, you try to think how Manto would have said, in a, you know, there is a famous Indian critic or was, of, uh, you know, uh, what's his name, Varisa. And he said, when Manto was writing Janki, he became Janki. So, you know, that's the only better way of doing it. I think we were lucky to have you here. That's very I'm good. grateful that you did this monumentous work and translating all of, you know, Manto's work into English. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you.